Thank you, Miss Erica and Miss Jessica. Thank you so much. Well, open your Bibles. We're going to be in the Old Testament this morning. We're going to be looking at a story I think that will be a help to you in 2 Kings chapter number 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4. And once again, I appreciate you being here. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord on the Lord's Day. If you're a member of uh, the St. Louis Cardinals, when they have practice, you'd want to be sure and show up. If you are a member of the Chicago Cubs and they have practice, you'd want to be sure and show up. And if you are a Razorback, member of the team, you'd want to be there when they have practice, wouldn't you? And if you were just a Razorback fan, you'd want to say, "Woo, pig suey, right? And so uh, when we have church, <laughs> when we have church, it's the Lord's day. We want to be in the Lord's house. This is where the Lord's people practice for what they're going to do out yonder next week. Isn't that right? Well, let's see. Let's, uh, let's look at our scripture this morning. And uh, we're in 2 Kings chapter 4. Before, you, before we do that, Miss Jade, would you? I need somebody to assist me. Would you come up here just for a moment? Bring your Bible. We're going to teach a Bible lesson here this morning. And uh, I always like to have some sort of an illustration. And I can't think of a, a nicer young lady. Come on up on the platform. And, uh, and, and you're on TV, by the way, seeing, being seen worldwide. Say hello to the folks in Africa <laughs> and Russia and uh, all over the world. And say hi to your mom. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. I, I know I'm putting you on the spot in front of all these people, but... Do you believe that your preacher is a man of God? Yes, I thought she'd say that. I mean, what else could she say? <laughs> do you believe I tell the truth? She does, see there? And uh, do you believe that I would ask you to do anything that I didn't think you could do? No. And so if I ask you to do something right here, right where you stand this morning, if I ask you to do something for me, and I know you can do it, would you do it? She would. I, I, she didn't speak out loud, but she nodded her head. <laughs> All right, would you give me $5? Well, now, I just said that, that you, you admitted that I wouldn't ask you to do something that you wouldn't do, right? Yes. So would you give me $5, please? <laughs> I don't have $5. You don't have $5. Yes, Can I see your Bible? Yes. All right, let's look. Oh, notes to a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> long place <laughs> let's see here mm. when we uh, when we have the word of God sometimes it supplies our needs let's see unless somebody has tampered let's see here oh look five dollars <laughs> you didn't know you had that did you I did now, would you give it to me? Yes, please. Thank you. Now, she didn't know that she had something in the Bible that she really had. And there's something that you may have from the Word of God that you don't know that you have. Thank you, Jay. God bless you. Let's read the Scripture, and I'll show you how this works. 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. It's a wonderful story here, and it reminds us of hidden resources hidden resources, hidden treasures that we may have that we don't know, resources that we could not use or provide on our own, and yet God provides for us. Now, let's read beginning in verse number 1. 2 Kings chapter 4, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take away unto him my two sons to be bondmen. So here's the situation. This widow woman owes some debt, and she has some boys, and uh, the, the creditors are going to come and take her boys and make them slaves because she can't pay the debt. Let's read on. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me what thou hast in thine house and she said thine handmaid hath 
not anything in the house. Now stop right there just for a moment. What did she just say? I don't have anything in the house. And then all of a sudden her memory is jogged and watch what she says. Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. She had a little flask of oil. And he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Borrow not a few. So what does that mean? Get a whole bunch? <laughs> borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out unto uh, all these, into the, all these vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. And so she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out, and, came, and it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and, thou, and live thou and thy children on the rest. May we pray together. Father, we pray that you would bless us, fill us with the Spirit of God. And Lord, may the Spirit of God cause our ears to hear and our hearts to feel and to sense and to know the truths that we hear this morning from the Word of God. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this lady turned out being dependent upon Almighty God and, uh, and proved in the, the Word of God, a truth that's taught in the New Testament. Think about this. In the New Testament... You've memorized this verse probably. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. You know the verse. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We have a vast supply. Brother Aaron sang the song about the, the indwelling spirit of God and that vast supply. It never runs dry. Old Testament taught this. The New Testament teaches this. And we may, just like Jade, and thank you for being a good sport, Jade. She played along very well. She didn't know that we were going to do this. And uh, it illustrates a great truth because just like she didn't know that I, during the break between Sunday school, I watched her go put her Bible down behind her mother and, uh, and I made sure her mama knew what I was doing. I put the $5 bill in her Bible so she wouldn't know it was there. I, I suspected she probably wouldn't read the entire Bible during break time and find the $5 bill. And so she didn't know it was there. And I called on her to give me $5. She didn't know she had $5, but there it was. Now what's the key? The key was that I knew it was there. Are you listening? I knew it was there. Now in the same sense, we have treasures, we have resources that God knows about that he gives and he doesn't call on us for us to do something or to give something that he has not already made preparation to supply. We have resources. Let's give the message a title this morning. Recognizing your resources. Recognizing your resources. All right, first of all, Let's notice, first of all, here in this passage of Scripture that there was a family that felt forsaken. Here's a family that feels forsaken. There's a widow woman. In verse 1, it tells us that her husband had been a preacher. He was, uh, do you see that phrase in there? That he was uh, one of the sons of the prophets. See it there? He was one of the sons of the prophets. He was probably a young man. They've got, they've got young children. And so he's a preacher. And now he's died and left his wife and boys behind. And she probably feels all alone. And she's got a burden on her heart. Not only has she lost her husband, but she's in debt. And now she has another burden. She, she's going to lose her boys. They're going to come and take her boys away because she couldn't pay her debt. 
And here's a man. He's been a preacher. Her, her husband was a man of God. He was serving God. Why was this happening to her? Well, sometimes we feel like things are happening to us. Maybe, you, maybe your family feels forsaken this morning. Maybe there's some things going on that, that nobody else quite understands. And there's some hurts, some heartaches, some needs there. And you just kind of feel a little bit forsaken. Well, here's a man of God that's passed away. His family feels forsaken. I remember when we moved off in the early 80s, I picked up my family, loaded up a U-Haul and moved to Oklahoma City to go to Bible college. Felt sure it was the call of God to be a preacher. Felt sure that he'd called us to go to Bible college and went out there with uh, no job, no house, no nothing. All I knew was there was a Bible college there. And uh, I remember what it was like in those days to kind of feel like, man, I've given up everything I thought to serve the Lord. Can't even afford to go to McDonald's to eat a hamburger. <laughs> I mean, really, maybe once a year we would scrounge up enough extra change that we'd eat at McDonald's. It was not a flourishing time. And uh, this woman is having a tough time. Now, remember that it was not easy on widow women in Bible days. It was a tough time. They didn't have anybody to provide for them many times and she had boys to raise she had two precious sons and and they're going to be carried away to a debtor's prison a family that feels forsaken notice number two the flask that was forgotten well Elisha says what have you got in your home and she said I've got nothing I've got nothing she had evidently sold everything that she had she had sold any furniture she had, sold, uh, sold her vessels, <laughs> sold any possessions that were left over by her preacher husband. She said, I don't have anything left in the house. And then she said, well, I've, I've got this little pot of oil. I've got a little flask of oil. And I believe what the scholars say in this passage of Scripture that the pot of oil probably had to do with her husband's ministry. In those days, the, the prophets would carry a flask of oil and they would dip their finger in the oil and anoint people when they prayed for them. We've anointed people in this church, put a little olive oil on their forehead and pray for them, and we've seen God do wonderful things. Is there particular power in that oil? Not in the oil itself, but the oil is symbolic of something. It is symbolic of the Holy Spirit of God and His power. And she had forgotten that she had this little flask of oil tucked away. It had been slighted. It had been overlooked. It, maybe it had been forgotten. But she had something there that she didn't remember. Now, I wonder if that's not true of many of us when we realize that we're empty and powerless and we think we have nothing and then someone reminds us, hey, you're a Christian. You have the Holy Spirit of God living within you. You have a river flowing within. You have an endless supply. Did you know that the Apostle Paul had something to say about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 in the New Testament? In the Old Testament, now those, those saints in the Old Testament did not have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But as New Testament Christians, you know that you have the Holy Spirit living within you. He's there. He's, uh, he's a permanent resident. He says he'll never leave you and never forsake you. 1 Corinthians six nineteen, Paul says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Now, he says, you folks in the New Testament age, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. Are you saved? Then you have the Holy Spirit. And I'm speaking to you and to me. And if we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit within us. And that's not a simple little thing. It's not like the Holy Spirit within us is just a simple emblem. I've got a Dodge truck out there sitting in the parking lot. Wish everybody had Dodge, amen? 
got a Dodge truck and on the side of my front fenders it has a little emblem that says Hemi it's a Dodge Hemi now you know that little insignia that little emblem on the fender of that truck itself does not mean much you could remove that from my truck and put it on one of your Ford trucks and well, it'd make it look a little better, but it wouldn't make it run any better. <laughs> but do you know what really counts? That Hemi emblem on the side of my truck says, under the hood, on the inside, there is a Hemi engine. And buddy, let me tell you something. For a 62-year-old man to get into a Dodge truck and tromp on the gas feed and feel that thing toss your head back and thrust you forward, you know there's a Hemi under there. There's something under the hood. It's not just a little slant six. It's not a four-cylinder. This is a Hemi V8. Got two cylinders and every spark, two park spark plugs in every cylinder. And that thing's got power. Now let me tell you something. It's one thing, listen, it's one thing to say, yes, I know the Holy Spirit lives within me. I'm a Christian. I know that. But it's quite another thing to realize and depend upon his power in real life situations. Hey, if you got the Holy Spirit living within you, you have a vast supply of power. And you've got something more than just an emblem. <laughs> you've got something real. The Holy Spirit lives within you. Now, this... For that woman, she had the little flask of oil sitting there unused, unappointed to any job, unrealized. Here's a sacred object. It's a slighted object. It's a saving object. The flask of oil that she had was what she needed, and she didn't know it, just like Jade didn't know she had the $5 bill in the Bible. I knew she wouldn't probably carry a purse up here, so I felt sure that that would work. And, friend, you have the Holy Spirit of God living within your body. And it should not be a slighted power. You know, God puts us through trials, doesn't he? God puts us through tests. Budgels have lost a loved one. And it's not an easy time. Some of you have lost loved ones. You know what it's like. Some of you suffered heartache from wavered children. And some of you have had financial reversals. Sometimes you're called on to do a new job. Maybe you got a new job and you're not sure you can do it. Maybe you've taken on teaching a Sunday school class. Appreciate Brother Denny taking on uh, Miss Kimberly's class. She's on deputation now for the mission field and and so she'll be laying out of church. I mean, traveling a lot. <laughs> and so Brother Denny's taking on that Sunday school class. And we talked yesterday, and he's, he said, I just hope I can do a good job out of it. Hope they don't all leave. <laughs> you know what? If we've got the power of the Holy Spirit operating within us, we'll do a good job. God never calls you on you. Listen to me. I, what I'm trying to say is God doesn't call you to do anything or bear anything but what he already has the supply of resources available for you. When he told Abraham, take your son, your only son, your only begotten son Isaac and go up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice your only son. Poor old Abraham had waited a long time to have that son. Now God says take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. How many of us would have gone? You can say what you want to about Abraham's failures, but I'll tell you one thing. He had a great deal of faith going up that mountain that day because Abraham knew that the same God that promised him that son would somehow deliver that son. And as Abraham went up one side of Mount Moriah, I think that old ram that God had made for a sacrifice that day was coming up the other side of the mountain. And they were going to meet there on top of Mount Moriah. And at the right moment, God's going to supply the sacrifice. How about that? Hey, what about, what about when, uh, <coughs> when God put the Holy Spirit in you? He knew that you'd face some times where you're going to need some power. And you need a supply. And you've got it. Well, the Holy Spirit lives within you. And you can do far more 
in his power than you can in the flesh. We'll come up bankrupt when we rely on the flesh. He anticipates our needs. God anticipates our needs and he's making preparation to meet them before we ever face that need. When Paul prayed, God had the prayer already present. God wants to meet our needs. And number three, faith that learned to function. A faith that learned to fun function. There was a family that felt forsaken. A flask that had been forgotten. And now here's a faith that needs to learn how to function. And she did. So here's what, here's what the, uh, the prophet told her to do. He said, now look, go out and borrow some vessels. She said, all I've got is this little pot of oil. He said, go out and borrow some vessels. And don't you borrow just a few. You get a bunch of them. And she went out and did what the prophet told her to do. Now, have you ever prepared for a miracle? That's what she was doing. She was taking the instructions from the man of God to prepare for God to meet her needs. Well, couldn't God have just given her the oil and given her the vessels and everything? Yeah, he could have. But he gave her the responsibility to exercise her faith. God wasn't about to do what he did without her cooperation. And would you learn this lesson this morning? God won't do for us what he wants us to do for ourselves. When he gives us a big task, he's going to give us a big job, a preparation to meet that task. And even though we will fall short on our own, he makes up the difference. But he wants us to do our part. When Jesus, think back, when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, do you remember the shortest verse in the Bible? John, what is it, 637? Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus, and the Bible says, and Jesus wept. Was he weeping because that person had died and he couldn't do anything about it? <laughs> no, he knew exactly what he was going to do. The only reason he was weeping is because of the people who were broken hearted. And by the way, God knows when you're broken hearted and he weeps with you. Jesus stood at the tomb and he commanded those people who were standing around to do what? Roll away the stone. And then he said, Lazarus come forth. Couldn't the man who raised the dead also roll away the stone? Why did he have those people to roll the stone away? He could have done that. Well, if God doesn't do what he wants you to do, he wants you to put your faith into action. He wants us to have a faith that functions. Yes, God could have made us robots where we just do everything according to his will. But he gave us a will of our own and he loves for us to be obedient to him. He loves for us to exercise faith in him. And so God didn't give us everything that we want so that we would ask him and cooperate with him and we would love him and worship him. God won't do that which we should do for ourselves. When Jesus performed his first miracle at Cana in Galilee, he went to this wedding and his mother comes to him and says, well, they're out of wine. They want more wine. And uh, so he commands the servants to do what? Go bring some water pots and fill them up with water. Well, couldn't the one who turned the water to wine go get the water pots? Couldn't he have just made them appear there? Couldn't he have also put water in them? Of course he could. But God wants us to be involved so we have a faith that functions. When poor old Noah back there in those days before it ever rained and, and God told him to be a preacher of righteousness. It tells us that in the New Testament. And Noah stood out there and preached and he worked on his ark and, and God wanted to deliver Noah from the flood that was coming. Why couldn't God just miraculously make the ark appear? I mean, after all, 
if the one who could call down the rains from heaven and break up the great fountains of the deep and flood the whole earth, and yes, I do believe he flooded the whole earth because the Bible says he did. If God is that powerful to flood the whole earth, why couldn't he just put the ark out there for Noah in the first place? Because he wanted Noah to build it. What's Noah doing? Noah's exercising his faith. He wants to, God wants Noah to have a faith that functions. You know what God wants out of me and you? He wants us to have a faith that functions, a faith that works. When the chips are down and the hard times come, when, when we can't have enough strength in the flesh to do what needs to be done, that we'll put our faith in him like this woman did. <laughs> Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you Jesus is speaking. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Well, doesn't God, isn't God omniscient? Doesn't he already know what you need? So why does he want me to ask? It's exercising that faith. The Lord Jesus said, knock and it shall be opened. He said, ask and it shall be given. Sure, God knows what we need. Prayer is an exercise of faith. He wants us to have a faith that functions. Well, couldn't God just speak from heaven and cause lost sinners to get saved? I mean, he could. But you know what he said in Mark 16, verse 15? And Jesus said this, listen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What's the key word there for us? Go. God wants people saved, doesn't he? And so could God just say, God's got a voice. He spoke the worlds into existence. Couldn't God just say from heaven on these big bull horn, Hey, all you sinners down there, trust Jesus as your Savior and you can go to heaven. God could do that, couldn't he? Sure he could but he said for us to go. You say, but I don't have the gift of gab and I'm not a sales-oriented type of person. I, I just don't, I don't do people well. <laughs> I'm not really a people person, you know. And so I don't think I could ever win anybody to Christ. That, that verse didn't tell you to win them. What did it say to do? Go. And what else? Preach. Now that's for, for, for everybody. That's not just for pulpiteers. That's for everybody. And so while we might be a little bit frightful of telling somebody how to be saved, God gives us the instructions to go. So what happens? Well, Acts 1.8. Jesus said just before he went back to heaven, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria, Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus is re-emphasizing the gospel command to evangelize the world. And he says, I want you to go and preach, and when you receive the Holy Spirit of God, you can be filled with power so that when you speak, your job is just to speak. Remember Mary Jo on the platform? I mean, I'm sorry, Jade on the platform? <laughs> All I asked her was to give me $5. She said, I don't have $5. <laughs> but it was there, and I knew it was there. God tells you to go and give the gospel to every creature on the face of the earth, and you say, I can't, but he says, you can. He says, I wouldn't call you to do anything that I didn't empower you to do. So when you speak the gospel, you tell somebody out of a broken heart how you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and how he saved you. If you'll tell them, and invite them to trust Christ, your job is done. You're relying on the oil, that indwelling power, that river of vast supply. And when you witness, your job is to speak the truth, and the Holy Spirit's job is to supply the power to convict their heart. He didn't call you to be a convictor. He called you to be a witness. How about that? Well, we have... A treasure within we have a treasure within just like that Bible had a five dollar bill within and whether we recognize it or not it's there if you're saved it's there 
God has given our church. A lot of wonderful provisions that we have that we may not recognize. Hey, God's given us 12 acres of property in the city limits on a busy highway. How good is that? For a brand new little church starting up that didn't have anything. <laughs> and he's given us a building, a nice building. That's opportunity to bring people in to hear the gospel. God's given us uh, uh, the technology to be able to broadcast now on every service, live stream, <laughs> and people watch and people listen to our messages and Sunday school lessons on the internet after the services are over. And we've got some wonderful opportunities. But it's up to us to do some of the parts that God wants us to do. Let me ask you this. Do you believe God gave us this building? I do too. Second question. Do you believe God wants people to get saved here? I do too. Third question. Do you believe we're supposed to sit on the pew and wait for them to come in? What's our job? To go. Hey, God's given us a job. He told us to go. And so, so what are we supposed to be doing this week? We're supposed to go out with this indwelling power, not not relying upon our finesse, not relying upon our ability to be an orator, but we're depending upon what God put within us, just like that $5 bill was placed within the Bible. God tells us to go and tell the folks, hey, come on over to church. Come to church with me. Wouldn't that be a good thing for us to do? He said, let, let, let me give you this, Luke 14, 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them, compel them, what does that mean? Compel them to come in that my house may be filled. God is saying, Jesus speaking in this particular passage, says go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them. That means would you please come to church with me? Please come. Ask them. We all work with people. We all have family. We all have friends. We all have acquaintances. And what God says to us is for us to do our part to go and tell them. In other words, talk, talk our church up. Can I just tell you that I believe the greatest advertisement that Liberty Baptist Church has today, the greatest advertisement is not the advertisement on the Internet. It's not what we've got in the yellow pages. Our greatest advertisement is not anything we might put on radio. You know what our greatest advertisement is for this church? people are sitting here this morning if we go out and say I'd like for you to visit my church with me would you come you say well I asked them one time asked them six years ago and they said they wouldn't come <laughs> maybe it's time to repeat the invitation my wife got saved three years before I did she would ask me a few times during the year usually around Christmas and Easter and maybe another time or two and she didn't bug me, she didn't nag me, but she would invite me to go with her. And I usually said, no. <laughs> but praise God, one day, one day, April 13th, 1980, she said, would you go with me to church today? I said, yes. Why did I say that? I have no idea, except she'd, she'd been praying for me, and people in the church had been praying for me, and I, God was working on me on the inside, and I didn't know it right then. I was too dumb to know what was going on, but God was drawing me. And thank God, I went that day, and the preacher preached about salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, that I could be cleansed from my sins. And I cherished that thought. I thought, God could cleanse me. God could save me. And when he gave the invitation, I went down and received what he gave me. By grace, the gift of eternal life. And couldn't we ask people more than once? Thank God my wife did. And probably somebody asked you more than once. And we have within us the gift of the Holy Spirit who can do what we can't do. What did Jesus say? Ask, and it shall be given. Knock, and it shall be opened. 
Let's just keep on knocking, amen. Let's keep on asking those people who haven't come yet. Let's ask them to come. Let's do our part because this woman, this poor widow woman, had nothing but a little flask of oil that she had forgotten. And God wanted her to exercise her faith, to have a faith that functions. You know what Liberty Baptist Church needs? is a faith that functions. You know what you need in your personal life? A faith that functions. This is not purely academic. This is real life. We're not in a laboratory. We're in real Christian life. We're doing battle for souls. But let me say this. As we invite people to come to church, we need to also realize that our part is to be faithful, not only to ask them, but our part is to be faithful to go to church. I thank God that there's people probably watching by way of internet this morning who were not able, maybe they're housebound, maybe they've got sick kids, maybe they themselves are sick, not able to get out of the house, and, and they're watching this morning. Thank God for the technology that enables people to see preaching on Sunday morning when they weren't able to get out. Thank God for that. But that's no excuse to stay home when you've got a Bible preaching church near you that you could be attending in person. And for us at Liberty Baptist Church, we have church more than just Sunday morning. We have church on Sunday night. We have church on Wednesday night. And how, how big is our witness if we just drop in once in a while? You know, God wants us to, could I just put it this way? God wants us to be motivated in our faith. It's one thing to know about faith and it's something else to use it. When we truly believe that we have the indwelling spirit who provides power for us to do things that's uncommon, we will accomplish more when we exercise faith, when we believe that we have that power, and when we are motivated. Let me ask you a question. Are you motivated? Are you motivated? Let me tell you, let me tell you about motivation. When I was associate pastor for Brother Sneather up in Mount Pleasant back years ago, <clears throat> I've told some of you this story before, but the folks on the internet haven't heard it yet, so I'll tell it for them. I was associate pastor and Brother Sneather was going out of town for the weekend and <clears throat> he he said, now, Brother Rick, there's he said, you know we've had we've had some people letting the air out of our bus tires on Saturday nights and when we go out on Sunday morning, the bus tires have been flat. He said, uh, you may not need to really get out early on Sunday morning, and, and if you have to air, air up some bus tires, uh, just be there early so you can get the buses rolling on time. And so I said, yes, sir. Well, he took off, and I got to thinking about it on Saturday afternoon. I thought, well, why should I have to go air up those bus tires? I could just keep them from going flat in the first place. So I loaded my 12-gauge shotgun, I hadn't heard that part about turning the other cheek yet. <laughs> I was a young preacher. I loaded my 12-gauge shotgun, and about dark, I drove up to the church house and sat down in the vestibule. There's glass doors. And so I, I just left the lights off and sat down with my shotgun there on the, on the, on the, on the, in the inside the doors of the vestibule so I could see down the hill. The buses were parked down the hill in front. And so I just sat there. And I sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there, and uh, about 10.30, I'm getting really bored and thinking, well, I guess, uh, I guess we're in luck. They're not going to bother us tonight. The vandals won't be here or they'd have come by now. And so I thought, I'll wait, I'll wait till 11 o'clock anyway. And so I sat around for 30 more minutes, and 11 o'clock came, not a sign of a soul or anywhere around. So I, I pushed the door open and was going to lock the door and leave. Just as I pushed the door open, I heard the sound. And I looked and... I couldn't see them, but I, I could tell which bus the air was going out of the tires on. And I thought, how did they get down there? And I couldn't see them. The bus was turned at a little bit of an angle, and they were on the back side of it. And so I walked out on the sidewalk and uh, still couldn't see anything. And so I said, hey, who's down there? And a couple of heads popped up from behind the hood of the bus, and they're looking up through there. And about that time, I raised the 12-gauge shotgun up an oak tree right above their head. Bam! Bam! Man, the limbs started falling out. And you know what? Those guys were motivated. 
you could hear their their shoes picking up gravel as gravel parking lot man they're going out of there man you could hear the gravels like a motorboat going through there gravel spewing in both directions i heard them when they hit the blacktop and i'm still hollering at them trying to scare them i said hey hey and I, when i heard them hit the blacktop man i heard their shoes going clickety clack man. Man, they're going down the blacktop, so I thought, I'll jump in the car, and, and, uh, and I'll beat them to town. We're about a quarter of a mile from town, so I'll beat them to town. I'll see who it is. And, uh, and so I jumped in my car and took off down there, and you know what? Those boys beat me to town. <laughs> now, they were motivated. They were motivated. I said they were motivated. They, they saw that they, need, they had a reason to get out of there. Now, I wasn't going to shoot them, but I, they didn't know that, and that 12-gauge going off above their heads. Put some motivation in them. You know what I'm saying? That when we're motivated, we get more done. They had faith that if they got out of there, they'd live. <laughs> you know what? If we've got faith to bring in lost sinners, we got faith to face the problems and the trials through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we have a faith that functions, that works, it'll motivate us. Well, you can get more done when you are motivated. You heard the old drunk out walking across the graveyard one night, was going home, took a shortcut through the graveyard, and they had an open grave left open there, and he fell in the open grave. And, and it had been raining, and it was slick, and the old banks of that grave was slick, clay mud. And he tried to climb out, and he tried and tried, and every time he'd get close to the top, he'd just slip back down. And he finally realized he wasn't getting out, and so he just sat down over in the corner and hunkered down, tried to keep the rain off of him, pulled his coat up over his head, and so he's just sitting there trying to endure the night. Well, unbeknownst to him, some other guy came along through the same graveyard. <laughs> he's walking along in his dark, and he fell in the same grave. And so that guy, man, he, as soon as he hit the bottom of the grave, he started trying to climb out. He'd climb and slip back down, climb and slip back down. He hadn't seen the old drunk back in the corner yet. After a while, the old drunk said, you're never going to get out. But he did. <laughs> When you're motivated, you'll get more done. Let me give you the fourth point, and we'll be done. Number four, there is a flow that never fails. There is a flow that never fails. Now, think with me back again. It says that she filled up jar after jar after jar. She filled them up. As long as she was pouring out, what happened? As long as she was pouring out into a jar, the flow kept coming. And the flow kept coming, and the flow kept coming. And then finally she gets down. She says, son, hand me another jar. There's still some oil in here. And he said, well, Mom, we've used them all up. There are no more. And then the scripture, look at it, it says, and the oil, what? Stayed. You know what? The blessings come in relationship to faith. How many jars did she borrow? According to her faith. <laughs> what if she had borrowed some more jo or jars? The blessings would have kept coming. The oil would have kept flowing. So here's the point. Here's the point. You're never going to run out when you're applying faith. The oil will not stop. The oil will be given in measure equivalent to your faith. We serve a mighty God. Sometimes people, sometimes people think, well, the preachers don't have it as tough in this spiritual battle as the rest of us do. <laughs> I mean, they've just got God's extra grace, and so they make it better. The rest of us have to work out there in the nasty world, around people ungodly people and so we have to face things and there are some things that, that some of you face that preachers don't face but the truth is we all face battles and the truth is there is a never ending flow of God's grace God's blessing the Holy Spirit of God His power as long as we exercise faith it won't stop it won't stop Charles Haddon Spurgeon one of the greatest preachers recognized not only by Baptists but by Christians world around Charles Haddon Spurgeon preached in London back in the 1880s, 1890s. Had crowds back in those days. They didn't even have PA sets. And in his Metropolitan Tabernacle, he would preach to four and five and 6,000 people 
on Sunday, every Sunday. By the way, they all came back for Sunday night services. Just thought I'd throw that in. You know what Charles had in Spurgeon? He was recognized as the prince of preachers. They said that he could hold a crowd spellbound. When he preached, every, every ear was peeled in his direction. Everybody listened when Spurgeon preached. And they said that was the prince of preachers. Life must have been pretty easy for him. I mean, probably all he had to do was sit around and write sermons. <clears throat> and so, naturally he'd be spiritual and not have very many battles to fight, we might think. Yeah, did you know that Charles Haddon Spurgeon's wife was extremely ill, had chronic illness that kept her bedridden for years and years and years. Spurgeon's wife underwent constant pain and while he was preparing his sermons, sometimes she'd be weeping in the bedroom because she was in pain. Easy. And yet he kept writing his sermons. He was looked down upon. You say, man, he was a great preacher. Everybody thought he was great. No, not everybody. He had his detractors. He had other preachers that attacked him fiercely because he was a conservative, because he believed the Bible because he took a stand against liberalism and wouldn't budge, he had other preachers who attacked him constantly. But he kept writing his sermons and he kept getting in touch with God and he kept preaching and people kept getting saved. And he himself, Charles Spurgeon wrote this in his autobiography. He said, I understand what it means to be depressed. He said, I constantly, constantly was the word he used. He said, I constantly fight against bouts of depression. He had a sick wife. He had people who hated his guts. He himself had constant depression. And depression can leave many people debilitated, unable to function. But Spurgeon, in spite of all these obstacles, kept getting in front of God and doing business with God and seeking God's face and walking with God and getting God's word, and he never ran out of sermons because he had a never-ending supply. And as long as Charles Spurgeon keeps writing sermons, I'll never run out of sermons either. <laughs> what am I trying to say? I'm saying there's a never-ending supply when you think you've come to your wit's end, there is yet more oil. Pour it out in faith and trust Him. If you're not saved today, you may wonder if God would save you. Why don't you just try Him and see? He says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And He'll do that. Friend, I got saved and He gave me rest. Life been perfect since? No, it's not been perfect, but I can face the trials with joy because he lives within me and supplies the power. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer?